did not know that Gary was going to sing that good song. I'm glad that he did. If I'd actually thought of it, I'd probably ask him to sing it or wouldn't like it because of what I'm trying to do today in my lesson. There are a host of people today who talk about God. There are a host of people who talk about God speaking to them. And many of them who talk about God speaking to them don't have any idea about saying God speak to us through His Word. Yet the very sentiments of that last song says that it does. But there's an attitude, there's a viewpoint, there's religious doctrine that says God directly deals with man as if there's nothing in between God and man, but there is. In nature in general, one may conclude that God exists. But from nature, no matter how much you know about it and how well you contemplate it, you cannot conclude from anything to do with it what God's will is for your life. That takes revelation. God must reveal his mind to you concerning how man is to live on this earth. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Thus, when you approach the Bible, the very fact that it's here implies that it's to direct you, to lead you, to train you, to teach you. And one of the things it does is to say that this life's uncertain and it's fleeting and it will end. And you don't even have to have the Bible to realize it's going to end because all around us every day, lives are ending, people are dying. And thus Hebrews 9.27 is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. God's trying to get us ready for the judgment. He gave us the Bible to help us do that. We're free moral agents. We can take it or we can leave it in this life. Leaving it, if you please, doesn't mean we don't suffer the consequences. Therefore, we must understand that God being the just God that he is, that even in this life, sin does not go unpunished. But there couldn't be sin if there wasn't a law because sin is a transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. All men everywhere are amenable to Jesus Christ. He said in Matthew 28, 18, all power, American standard, all authority, hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Now, we would do well to think sometimes that people out here on the creek bank today are playing golf or sleeping in late or whatever, that God holds them accountable for not being in the worship to worship Him with the saints. Well, you say, well, they're not even Christians. He holds them accountable for not qualifying themselves by becoming Christians. We don't understand that sometimes. But being put here in this world as rational, intellectual, free moral agents, God expects us to choose His way. His way is revealed in His Word. It's not revealed by some still, small voice from within. Jesus said in John 12, 48, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, these same shall judge him in the last day. So as you read your Bible, it gives great emphasis throughout the whole book to use our lives to study it, to understand how to study it, and to then obey it. But there are people who say, well, I think this is right. Or I feel this is okay. Or I don't see anything wrong with this. Well, I can say one thing. If you do not know the Word of God, the Bible, you're allowed to say anything or do anything, or at least attempt to. What we want to point out this morning is that whatever way you could conceive that God operating on you 
independent of the instruction of his words, the Bible is put here to do that instruction and that he does not do so except through his word. It is the instrument God uses to enlighten men, to teach men, to lead God and direct men, Ephesians 6, 17. And, of course, as I said already, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. When you look into the book of Hebrews, chapter 4 and verse 12, the writer of Hebrews plainly says, For the word of God is quick and powerful, meaning alive and active, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit, the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Paul then would say to Timothy, preach the word. When you look at the book of James, you'll see that James begins his talk, if you please, put in print, by saying, Wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. Now watch, and receive with meekness the engrafted or implanted word which is able to, to save your souls. And then he admonishes those who receive that word, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. People who know what the Bible says and they don't do it, deceive themselves. People who think they know God's will by some still small voice or some hunch or notion or feeling are going to deceive themselves. Now, for the remainder of the time, let's look at this to see that what man might think that God does separate and apart and independent of the Word of God, God does through His Word. Now, God could instill in us directly faith, confidence, trust in Him and His gospel without the Word, but He doesn't, does He? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Somebody else might come along and say, well, he might enable us to enjoy a new birth. And yet Peter writes to Christians in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 23, having been begotten again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by or through the word of God, which liveth and abideth. Now those people that heard the gospel, God's power to save men from sin, Romans 1, 16, they had understood it and they had obeyed it. Peter writes to them, reminding them of what they did to encourage them to remain faithful. And thus we enjoy the new birth through the instructions of God in His Word. Well, He might give us light in the sense of enlightening us, but David said in Psalms 119, verse 130, the entrance of thy word giveth light. And we must recognize the fact that he might give us wisdom, but and we're told to pray for wisdom, aren't we? But I learned from 2 Timothy 3, 14 and 15, that the scripture says, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. I suggest if you break down that, some of you wanting a sermon, you've got a lot to preach on right there. When you think about the very putting together of the sentence and what he's trying to convey and the details of it. Then we also see from Psalm 19, verse 7, connected with that, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Well, then why don't we pray for it? Because we understand God's providential workings, and especially his workings with his own children who are children by their knowledge and obedience to the truth and living daily is the truth the word of God directs them. God could just reach down and convert us without the word. But Psalm 19.7 says the law of the Lord is perfect. 
converting the soul. Now I pause here and remind you that the definition of a law, of the word law, is a rule of action. Truly God can do some things directly. But when he does it through a rule of action, a law, he still nevertheless has done it. Who made the law? The very laws of nature are here because they have to do with the way nature works, whatever is natural works. There are various laws. Man may not even have discovered a lot of those laws. Oh, he discovered a lot. But there may be a lot more to discover. The point is, when he works through a law, and that law is given to mankind through his word, then he still does it. The church is charged as a spiritual body of Christ to preach the gospel. We talk about in the church doing the Lord's work, but he does it through us. And when we do what he said by submitting to his authority, the Bible, God's work is done. Nothing for us to glory in. He might open our eyes, as it were, spiritually, enlightening us. But listen to Psalm 19.8. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. So whatever somebody might say he would do directly, independent of a rule of action or a law, the Bible is saying he does it through a rule of action or a law. And that's important for us to recognize when we approach the Bible. Continuing with this line of thought, and that's why we encourage people to constantly study and meditate on the Word of God and why the Bible itself does that. He might give us understanding. Now, notice there are times the Bible records that God worked miracles in the life of Christ, in the life of the apostles, the miraculous gifts existent in the first century church in lieu of a completed New Testament through the laying on of the apostles' hands. People learn languages. I say learn. They didn't learn them. They were given to them directly to speak through the gift of tongues. There was the gift of faith. Well, I know faith comes by hearing the Word of God routinely and regularly, Romans 10, 17. But there was the gift of faith. That meant men's confidence and trust in God and His system was infused in them without the normal way it was done in the gift of faith. You say, well, Brother Brown, what was that like? I have no idea. I can't conceive of standing here before a crowd of Russians and starting to speak Russian without, without uh, having studied it. I don't know what that would be like. Or any of the other nine miraculous gifts existed in the infant church through the laying of the apostles' hands. Don't know how that would work. I don't even know what it, certainly what it would be like as an apostle to lay hands on somebody and there would be a miraculous gift imparted. Those things were temporary and provisionary. They were temporary until the Word of God could be fully revealed, confirmed, and set down. Thus they were provisionary. They provided for what the Word of God would do permanently. That's why you have in the Scriptures such things as what John wrote in John 20, 30, and 31. And many other signs did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Christ is the Son of God, that believing you might have life through his name. Now, if miracles or direct work of God would always take place, why did God have John, an apostle who could work miracles and saw the miracles of the Lord firsthand, say that these are written? Because they're written because they're going to abide, but the miracles will cease. You want to know about a miracle? I'll read you one. Don't ask anybody today to work a miracle like Christ's work or the apostles' work because that's setting aside the laws of nature. They can't do it. The old saying goes, if you think you can work miracles like Christ did, the apostles did, let's go to the graveyard. You tell them to get up, I tell them to stay down. I can guarantee you which one will have the impact. 
miracles had their place. And if you look at the beginning of time, it all started by miracle, but then the laws of nature came to effect. Think of how Adam and Eve got here. People don't still get here that way. But there is the law of procreation. That's how they get here now. And when the church started, it started by a miracle. Read Acts 2 and you see miracles all over the place. Because people had to know that what those apostles were speaking was from heaven and not from men. So God did that for us. Yeah, but that was 2,000 years ago. What changed? Time doesn't change anything. Does time change a fact? No, it's still a fact, no matter how old it is. Nobody can successfully disprove that those men or Christ did not work miracles. They did. It doesn't make a difference whether they worked them yesterday, 1,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, or longer. They were worked and they're set down. You can look at that in recent history or ancient history. The American Revolution. Anybody question it here that it actually took place the way the history books record it? But nobody here experienced it. With your five senses, you don't know. You say George Washington existed. You do that by evidence. Witnesses and adequate evidence. And so it is that the same thing stands true for anything in past time and space, which is history. Because you can't go back and experience it. Can we only know what we can experience? No, we can't. We can know a lot much more by contemplation of the facts that come down to us. And that's how we know God exists. By the facts in nature that imply God. And thus we have the miracles. They were necessary, but they weren't to be permanent. They were provisionary and they were temporary. But the word of God is said all along, it, claiming itself in the middle of all these miracles, they said, preach the word. While they were working miracles, they said, preach the word. Has the word changed? No, it hasn't. Have miracles ceased? Yes, they have. Why? They completed their reason for existing. Well, God might directly make us alive or quicken us. But long ago in the Old Testament in Psalms 119, verse 50, the psalmist said, This is my comfort in my affliction, for thy word quickened or made me alive, quickened me. He might save us directly. But the scripture reads, as we just read in James 1, 21, Wherefore, putting away all filthiness and overflowing, superfluity of wickedness or naughtiness, receive with meekness, there's a disposition of mind that ought to exist when we approach constituted authority, especially God's authority, the engrafted or implanted word which is able to save your souls. Sanctification means being set apart, suitable for the master's service. Something had to work that way and work on us that we might be set apart and suitable to serve God. It's the Word of God that does it. Jesus prayed on the night before His crucifixion, Father, sanctify them through Thy truth. Thy Word is truth. If a person is sanctified or set apart, suitable to serve God as a faithful Christian, it will be through His proper knowledge and submission to the Word of God. He might make us pure directly, but he doesn't. Seeing you have purified your souls in your obedience to the truth. We've already studied this on Wednesday night. No telling how many times most of us are read it. Unto unfeigned or pretended love of the brethren. Love one another with a pure heart fervently. Notice how all these overlap. Sanctifies, purifies, save us quicken us or make us alive spiritually and he might cleanse us but in John 15 3 Jesus is speaking to the apostles concerning his departure and the Holy Spirit coming to guide them into all truth says already you're clean because of the word which I have spoken unto you then you read in Romans 6 17 and 18 
these words. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, that you've obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. You see, he could have made us free from sin directly, without any rule of action, without anything on our part. But he didn't. He chose not to. He made us free from sin, not directly, but through our adherence to his truth. Now, I pause here to say there's a host of folks in this world that says if you're, that, that teach that if you're saved by the grace of God, then there's no law involved. That you don't have to obey God's word. Well, that's simply attempting to take a human doctrine that could not be sustained and cannot be found in the Bible and force the Bible into supporting it. If I were to stop right here before we go a little further with these things, you would see that law does not exclude or fight against or oppose the favor of God. The favor of God is extended to man through God's law, God's word, the seed of the kingdom, which is the word of God, Luke 8, 11. So he makes us free from sin. He cleanses us. He purifies us. He sanctifies us. He saves us. He quickens us all through the Word. Now, the Word just being here, that Bible you have in your hand right now or close by, won't do you a bit of good. Even if you can memorize it and accurately recall every bit of it, it won't do you a bit of good until you decide to submit your mind and life to it. Then there's changing that takes place. Notice that he might impart to us a divine nature directly. He could do that. But the scripture says, Whereby he hath granted unto us his precious and exceeding great promises, that through these, through these ye may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption of, that is in the world through lust. 2 Peter 1, 4. How can I escape the corruption that's in the world through lust? I do it through the truth that's in the word that God expects me to study because I love him and I demonstrate my love for him and my faith in him and his system of salvation by giving that study time to him. 2 Timothy two fifteen, Study to show thyself approved unto God. American Sanders says, give diligence. That is, all that we are and have, we put into understanding the truth. And that's what we ought to do all our life. And yet few of us really give much time to the genuine study. That is, really being studious when it comes to the Bible. God could directly fit us for glory. But he doesn't. Paul said, and after addressing the finishing his addressing of the Ephesian elders, as Luke records in Acts 20, he had this to say in verse 32. In the days of miracles, and Paul could work them. They were still being done and would be done for a while. But he says to the elders of the church at Ephesus, now I commend you to God and to the word, now watch it, of his grace. How can a person read word of his grace and say that one excludes the other? The word is here by the favor of God, the greatest proof of God's favor as far as what you can touch right now is your Bible. It's here because God favors mankind to put it in the world. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. 2 Timothy 3.16 Notice it's able to build you up. What is? The word to build you up. And do what? Give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. Acts 20 verse 32. Now question, what more would a person want? And yet God expects us to play a part in this. It's not just done directly. God wants to see people in heaven who want to go to heaven, but they've never been there. That's an amazing thing. I don't know what all's in store for the glorified saints when this whole system's over and done with, but I know that what we're doing now fits us for whatever God has in store for us in the glories of heaven. I wish I understood more about that. I'm a human. I'm curious, but I don't know. I just know the system God has set up 
this natural system, is not to last forever, but is to be used as God intended, that is, to find him and serve him faithfully, and thereby show my love for him above and beyond anything else, and to show my faith in him and his system of salvation, the gospel system, and will trust it more than anything else. So I'm back now to Matthew 6, 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of these things shall be added unto you. And his righteousness gets us back to the word of God. David said, Psalm 119, verse 172, My tongue shall speak thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. If I would be righteous, I'm going to be concerned about keeping his commandments. But his commandments are in his word. I'm going to be concerned about submitting to the authority of my Savior, who is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by him, John 14, 6. I'm going to be concerned about whatsoever I do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now, there's no way I can do all in the name of the Lord and not submit to the last will and testament of Jesus Christ pertaining to my conduct here, whether it's worship or daily living. So he might strengthen us to live godly. And I'm not talking about providence. Again, keep that in mind. I'm talking about instruction from God as to how we are to live each day. Psalm 119, 28 reads, Strengthen me according to thy word. All of these things he could do directly to us to make us whatever without our will involved. But the way he has made man and so constituted him and placed him where he's placed us gives us the chance to prove ourselves. To make sure we're operating according to the authority of the one we say is our Savior and submitting to his will, or we don't. Thus, we're in a time of probation in the flesh. As somebody said a long time ago, God casts the vote for us. The devil casts the vote against us. Guess who holds the deciding vote? I do. And I'm told, choose you this day whom you will serve. And Joshua says, here's the vote you ought to cast. But it's for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You can't serve God and not obey him. You can't benefit from what he is by his favor that we don't deserve given to us. You can't do it. And thus, Paul wrote to Titus, the young preacher, making it clear in Titus 2, that the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us. Now, I want to know where he teaches us. That favor, that grace is Jesus Christ. Notice, hath appeared, past tense. At the time he wrote this, that grace had appeared. Well, you read John 1, in verse 14, the Word was made flesh. We beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. If you continue my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, John 8, 31 and 32. Preach the word. You'll learn about the grace of God that no man deserves and cannot merit, and you'll learn about as a free moral agent how you respond to it. Receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul. How do I receive it? I learn it. I study it as it is, the revealed mind of God for me because God loves me and it's the only way I get to heaven. If you had never, never, never been from here to New York City, and maybe some of us haven't. I'm talking about driving. But you knew in New York City you were going to be given about $25 million as soon as you got there. You would be very diligent in making sure that you got there, first of all. And if you were expected to drive, you would be very particular about how you went. And I imagine you would try to choose the shortest distance to get there. The point is, we can see things like that, that we ought to be careful. We ought to be cautious. Or to use words like the Bible used, see then you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time for the days are evil. The days are evil. Satan is our arch enemy. As a roaring lion, he goes about all day long every day seeking whom he may devour. Here we are. Are we going to be Satan's food? 
So we have over and over again words of the Bible telling us what to do, how to live, how to examine ourselves to see whether we be in the faith, and what to do if we find that we have erred. We're told to repent, confess our sins, pray God for forgiveness. God's covered it all, but you won't know about it if you don't know the Bible and the Word of God right and divided, and you don't have the right attitude about it. You won't. So if you are waiting for God to directly, independent of His Word, to do all these things we studied today, it'll never happen. You're going to do your part. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Approved unto who? Why are you studying? Approved unto God. So you won't have to be ashamed. Ashamed before who? God. Right in dividing or handling or right the Word of Truth. The most important thing we ought to do today is to learn how to study the Bible. Spend much time in the study of it. And then reviewing honestly and objectively our life in the light of it. Then if we find we haven't obeyed the gospel, though we may have thought we had. We may think that before we study the Bible, we're all right with God. And then find out we have not done God's will regarding becoming a Christian. And in this lesson, we studied a little while ago what God requires in the great plan of salvation. And we learned from the Bible and more specifically, the New Testament of Christ. And we learn it's our obligation then to submit to it with the proper disposition of mind toward it. As a child of God, we can learn how to review our lives. Am I faithful? Am I not? You can leave here today knowing one way or the other. When we offer the invitation at the end of religious assemblies, we're expecting people, if they've been honest with themselves, God and His Word, to know whether they leave saved or lost. And if they're still honest, if they're lost, they now know what to do to be saved. There's no reason for any person who's accountable to God to leave this assembly or any other assembly convened for religious purposes where the whole council of God's preached on these matters to leave lost, except that they don't want to do what God said. That's it. That won't stand up with judgment, will it? So we appeal to everybody to receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save their soul, whether it's been becoming a Christian are living a faithful Christian life. If you can know today in this assembly convened to worship God, for Christians to worship God, that you have worshipped Him acceptably, then you can know everything else you need to know about any phase of life as to what you've done. And we can know that we have worshipped God in spirit and in truth through the five acts of worship authorized in the New Testament, and therefore we've done what we should. Now, if somebody today was thinking about burning the beans at home or whatever, they need to repent of that. But we can. We can know that because God made us to be instructed, made us to be able to see whether we're right or wrong in our thinking and our actions, and if we're wrong, to change our lives. It's called repentance. If you need to obey the gospel, why let it pass now when you don't know you'll ever get home today? And someday we won't be there anymore. And it'll be the last time we ever are together like this on this earth. If you're subject to the Lord's good invitation, we ask you to come while we stand and sing.